Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for the CU Online Symposium. My name is Amy Ositinsky. I am one of the instructional designers at CU Online. Um, and today I have the pleasure to introduce to you Jason Drysdale, um, who is the manager of instructional design over at the College of Nursing on the Anschutz campus. And he is going to talk to you today um, a little bit about the collaborative mapping model, which is something that CU Online is participating in and offering to faculty, um, which is something that Jason created and was kind enough to share with us. So um, I will go ahead and pass the microphone to him and uh, you can get started. Cool. Thanks. All right. Am I on? Yes, I am. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Jason. It's good to meet you all. I hope I get to meet you all individually after this and talk to you a little bit about what you do and, and where you work and uh, some of the interests you have um, in your work. Um, one of my interests is pop culture. Uh, and one of my favorite TV shows has always been How I Met Your Mother, um, even though it's been gone for a few years now. So one of the main characters, Ted Mosby, in the show um, is an architect. He's building this building in New York, um, one of the youngest people to build them, to change the New York skyline. And um, he wakes up in the middle of the night having this nightmare and goes and tells his friend about it and says, you know, there's this, there's this urban legend about a university where an architect built a library but um, forgot to account for the weight of the books when he put his plan together. And so as a result, the, the library slowly sunk into the ground over time um, and eventually had to be condemned. And he just looks at her and he says, what if I forget about the books? What if I forget completely about, you know, I choose one light bulb and it's 60,000 of them in this building and it could make people's heads hurt for the next, you know, however many years. Um, the point of this, of course, is that designing a course, there's so many books, figuratively and literally, to be thinking about, right? Um, so many little things and small components to a, a larger system of connected information, ideas, and experiences um, that can be really challenging to design intentionally. And so the collaborative mapping model is something we've been using in the College of Nursing for about two and a half, three years now. Um, and it was basically a way to connect a dedicated instructional designer with individual faculty to bring what we both do best to the table and uh, think about all these books. Think about all the small things that go into designing a course together um, and come away ideally with a, a transformational experience for your students and empowering you all as faculty to really um, invest uh, your time teaching and uh, uh, enjoying that community um, instead of worrying about the books as you go throughout your course. Um, so there are several different uh, tools you can use to do um, a visual course map like this, a collaborative course map. So I'm going to walk through four of the different tools. I'll tell you which one we use the most, um, which, which has been most effective for me. Um, but each has kind of their own, uh, their own quirks, their own benefits uh, that may work well for you. So this first one is called Poplet. Um, it is uh, uh, the only one of these four that has a, a native mobile app. So it's great for doing design work if you're interested on using your tablet, if you have an iPad. I think there's an Android app as well, um, if you prefer uh, Android or Google products. Um, and this is sort of an overview of the template that we use to develop these maps. And I'll, I'll walk through that in just a few minutes here. Um, but something I really like about Poplet is you can see my name on each of these little items here. Anytime you share a map with another person, one of these, one of these maps, um, uh, if you edit each of those little bubbles, um, it will put your name on top of it. So you can keep track of who's making changes to what elements consistently. You can also tag media, PDFs, uh, YouTube videos, that sort of thing to them um, um, if you want more complex elements on each, on each item. Um, so it, it's really good for, for collaboration and it's really good for mobile users. Uh, this next one is called Coggle. Um, it's a little bit out of my personal comfort zone because I tend to like things a bit more orderly and structured. This one has um, some structure to it, but it gives you a little less sophistication on the types of things that you can put into, uh, into the maps. Um, they're a bit more conceptual in nature. Um, but the good thing about, about Coggle is that it syncs well to, to Google Drive, so you can have some nice... Uh, Nice um, interoperability there with your Google account if you're a Google user. Um, so Coggle, a little less flexible, 
um, in terms of the design work that we can do with the, with the tool, but it's still a, a great option. If you're going, coming at it from a, a less um, uh, content focused perspective and maybe a bit more conceptual in nature. The next one, Spider Scribe, um, obviously doesn't look as nice as the other ones. It looks like it's out of like Windows XP from 2000 or something, um, but the tool is pretty good. It, it does a lot of the same stuff that Poplet and um, the next tool, Bubble.us, um, that they do. It's just kind of um, a, a run-of-the-mill basic kind of thing. But if you're familiar with, with Windows and kind of how that operates, um, then the way the, the user interface is designed for this, you'll be comfortable and familiar with it. So it can be a good way to kind of break the ice, get into, get into these types of tools. Finally, this is the one that I've been using for four plus years now, bubble.us. Um, the colors are vibrant. It's easy to change colors. It's easy to resize each bubble, which is super useful if you've got a lot of text. Um, my favorite thing about it is, you know, as a manager of instructional design, I have somewhere around 100 or so maps that I've got at any given time from the courses I design with my faculty and the curriculum work that we do. Um, this gives me a great search option. Um, you, can, you can organize them really efficiently and effectively, um, and it's just better for large numbers of maps. So um, they do have a, a mobile, uh, it's not an app, but you can, you can, they've got like a mobile uh, browser enabled version of it. It doesn't work great, so I'd probably recommend sticking to your computer if you use this one. Um, but of all of these four tools, I think it's probably the most powerful and the most flexible. Um, so it's, it's very useful. So let me walk through um, a template for you all. Yeah. Um, all of those are free. So all you have to do is, is search for them in Google. Um, each of the names, Poplet, Bubble.us, they all have free accounts up to probably three maps um, for each of them. Um, and then they have paid accounts too further for that if, if you decide you want more than that. Nope. Yep. These are just exactly. These, so the question was: these aren't these aren't um, LTIs. They're not apps inside of Canvas itself. They are um, they're they're web based apps. You just type type into Google, find it in your browser, and it'll pop up. You create an account, um, just like you would with with other tools. Yeah. So this should be pretty straightforward and easy to to use. Yeah. Thank you. This. Tell me if this, if you can see this or not, and I'll zoom in a little bit as we go. So, oops. So this is the overview um, uh, of the template. Uh, I like to structure things first. I like to have tech requirements here, just to keep in mind a general sense of the type of things that you you expect your students to do from a technical standpoint. We often overlook that, but especially for online courses, it's just important to be transparent with your students and. Have your expectations clear for yourself as well on what you anticipate your students will use um, and what would be best for your students to use for the content, the experiences you're developing. Course description, mostly just to keep kind of keep your eyes on the target, you know, um, pretty straightforward. Um, and then each week, uh, each, each week's topic is uh, here in the green row at the top. Um, I like to structure this in a weekly capacity, especially for online courses, because this is the way your students will experience your course. Um, most likely, if you have a single topic that stretches beyond uh, one week, that's totally fine. I just encourage you to do week one, topic one, week one, topic one, part two, or something like that. Um, so that there's clear expectation each week. Um, so your students know there's purpose behind what we're doing. We've got a clear um, an intentional path to follow. Um, yeah, so that's the, the first row here. The next row, readings, videos, lectures. This is all the passively consumed content that your students will experience in the course. So I put articles, book chapters, um, YouTube videos, lectures, anything that your students will, will kind of sit down and consume knowledge from. Um, that's where I like to put this. Uh, the final row here are assignments, um, learning activities, whatever you call them. These are, these are, this is the row that's specifically for uh, graded activities. Um, the reason that's at the bottom instead of the top, there's sort of two reasons here. 
Um, one is that even though we design courses from a backwards perspective, so starting with the outcomes and moving up toward the experience from students, students experience it the opposite direction. So they're gonna find the, the topic first, then they're gonna find the content, and then they're gonna go into their activities. And so the goal is to help shift your perspective a little bit from content, content expertise, faculty perspective, to how will my students experience my course? And so we'll design from a backwards perspective, but look at it from the student's experience. And then the other reason is um, assignments align to the outcomes you've created in your course. Um, so we wanna show on every, every assignment that there's purpose and that the design was intentional, that each, each assignment, uh, there's no busy work in the course, there's purpose and function uh, to each thing that your students will do. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of a, a, just a very brief overview. Um, it looks pretty simple. It is, that's intentional. Um, but the conversations that can happen around this is the center point for uh, um, making instructional changes to your course can be really rich and fruitful. Um, so any questions about this, I'd be happy to answer. Um, if not, we'll move on to the next piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, we do. We put these in on the home page of every course or in the first module. Um, it's, of course, up to faculty if they want to do that. But our students in several programs have started asking for the maps because they like the sense of transparency that comes with knowing everything they do has purpose and value. Um, you, can, you can do it a couple of different ways. You can export these as PDFs or as images. You can also embed them directly on your homepage through the HTML code, which is super easy to do. Um, so I like doing the, the HTML embed because then students can collapse different things and move it around and kind of um, play around with it a little bit more than just the static kind of thing. Yeah. Who else? Any other questions? Um, so there are a few things that we can look at using the, the collaborative mapping model that are easy to overlook uh, when you're designing a course independently or when you're using a structure like um, a, a, a table or your syllabus to do the primary design work. Um, you know, this, this visual map is a design document. It's very intended to be fluid and, um, and simple so that uh, we, we can have conversations around the things you're doing on a, on a couple of different levels. Um, the first one tends to be maybe a little contentious, so bear with me, uh, but it's workload calculation. Um, on that template, we had the, the orange row, which was focused on content, right, passively consumed information, and the next row about assignments. Um, workload calculation, the whole, the whole point of this is to look at the balance that your students are spending in passively consuming content and creating or doing active learning experiences. Um, there's not necessarily a perfect equation for that. We're not looking for a 50-50 split. Um, it's different every week, and that's your expertise as faculty to really determine what your students need. The key here is about being intentional. Um, so the, the definition of a credit hour um, is uh, one hour of lecture, two hours of homework per credit hour per week. And so that's where this nine times 15 equals 135 thing comes from. We have essentially 135 hours of total student work in a single 15 week course um, to walk them through all of the outcomes of your course and for all of your assignments. And that's, that's the federal definition of what a credit hour is. Um, and so kind of what we're looking at here is how can we maximize this time and really see how much time students are investing in each of those experiences experiences we've designed rather than just an impression but kind of give more of a guideline for what what amount of time it takes them to do each of those things so this is a uh, uh, just like I said a guideline it's not intended to nickel and dime your course or you um, to focus too much on like a punitive look at how much time your students are taking with each of these activities but it gives you a sense of what you value as an instructor and uh, as a result, what you're asking your students to value in their learning experiences. Um, there's also, and I'll pull this up here in a minute, a, a great 
uh, workload calculator that, that Amy found from Rice University that uh, kind of corroborates this work and that has a bit more sophistication. I, I created this more as a quick reference guide. So if you just want to get a general look at what you're doing in your course, this is a good way to do it. If you're looking at being a lot more specific, I'll show you that workload calculator and it's a great option as well. So technical reading uh, is anything that students go to to look up terms in from Wikipedia. That's a pretty good definition of it. Uh, any charts and graphs um, that are associated with it, a glossary, additional research that they'll have to find to figure out, you know, to uncover more information about that reading. So um, it's, it's the highly technical stuff um, that is more common in certain disciplines like nursing and less common in others, right? Non-technical, it's, it's prose, it's um, nonfiction that's, uh, that's narrative in nature, anything that students can kind of move through quickly and get a good sense of it rather than really dwelling on the specific information uh, is 20 pages an hour. Uh, reflective writing, about a page an hour, and that's if it's true reflection. We talk about reflection, we're not talking about analysis. Analysis being we're looking at something external and giving an opinion or a perspective about it. Reflection being I'm, I'm talking about how I've encountered those things, so they're experiential in nature. Uh, research writing, pretty straightforward, same thing with online discussions. Um, if your online discussions are taking more than two hours for your students to complete, then they might be less discussions and more mini papers. Um, and my perspective on discussions is mostly that they're, they're a place for students to test out new ideas, to work together, to come to new knowledge and understanding, not so much to check their APA knowledge. And there are better ways to do that. So I would encourage you as you, as you look at the designs of your course, you consider your discussions. Think, think if those are spaces where your students are actively um, uh, participating uh, on, on a deeper level than just, did I answer the question? Are they, are they really having a conversation with each other about, about challenging questions and topics for your work? Um, and that's what we're aiming for with that two hours. This whole thing, by the way, is written from the perspective of sort of an average student. So you will certainly have people who do stuff a lot quicker than this and some who will take much longer. Uh, we're just kind of looking for a general ballpark of what to expect. And here is the workload calculator from Rice. So you can see reading assignments, writing assignments, exams. You can talk about the number, you can add number of pages per week, page density, difficulty, and it'll, it'll calculate the info for you. Yeah, sure. It's, uh, oh, sorry, that's pretty small, isn't it? cte.rice.edu slash workload. A little blurry there. Yeah, it's a good tool. And if any of you would like the slide deck, please let me know. I'd be happy to send it on to you. Okay, next item is uh, purposeful design. So I'm, heard of, I'm sure you've heard this phrase before, engage your students. We have Picard to help us out here. Um, engagement is, a, a, there's so many elements to it and it's a really complex thing, right? Um, but whether it's administrators or your students on end of course surveys, everybody's talking about how they want better engagement in their courses, which basically means I wanna be interested. I wanna care about what I'm doing. I want there to be purpose and, um, and value behind what I'm doing. And so pretty regularly when I build a course map, uh, when we design together with faculty, um, I'll ask a simple question about a learning activity or a video. Um, and it's this question, can you share with me why you made this decision for your course? Typically the answers revolve around the content, it's foundational material, uh, it's the next step in the process, whatever it may be. They need this before they get to that. Um, but when we address the instructional purpose of specific design decisions, such as why are we doing a test here instead of a paper, or uh, is this better to be a passive learning experience or an active one, or maybe something where students are collaborating instead of doing independent work, um, the answers tend to get a little bit more murky. Because as faculty, the focus tends to be a bit more on the things that you're passionate about, which is your content, your work, right? That's where you put all of your heart and soul into. 
And that's good. I'm not interested in diminishing that. But looking also at the purpose of your instructional experiences is a critical way to ensure that your students will be engaged, remain engaged, and move toward the outcomes that you're establishing for them in your courses. Um, Technology is another element of this. Um, of course, we're at the CU Online Symposium. We want to find out new technologies and everything. And that's, that's awesome. But I would encourage you to look at the purpose of those technologies in your course. Um, Twitter is a good example. People for a long time, since 2009, have been thinking about good ways to use Twitter in their courses. And there just aren't a whole lot, you know? They're, mostly it's used as a replacement for the LMS to have increased engagement outside of a, a, a typical course structure to engage with the community of thought around your specific discipline. That's a good way of using it. Having a hashtag associated with your class during lectures, that might be a good way to, to do it if your students will use it. Um, but there was all this talk about it as a good instructional tool, and then like nobody used it, you know, because there wasn't a lot of purpose behind it. So when you look at the uses of technology in your course, don't just think, is this cool? Will my students like it? Think, will this provide a transformational experience in their learning in an intentional way? And that's really the heart of, of making intentional design decisions. And probably the, the bulk of the time we spend uh, doing design work with faculty is on this one. Uh, this criteria and on this next one here, which is outcomes alignment. Uh, this is pretty straightforward in, in principle, uh, but gets to be pretty complex when you look at uh, outcomes language, um, the, the, the leveling, the types of experiences you want your students to have, that sort of thing. So I like to kind of look at it three different ways that you can evaluate your outcomes through the mapping model. Uh, the first uh, is redesign. So assignments that meet no outcomes when you do your alignment can be redesigned. Uh, uh, outcomes that have no assignments can be reconsidered. Maybe they don't belong in your course. Maybe they need to be rewritten. And then finally, reevaluate the quality of your outcomes, uh, chiefly among that being, are they measurable? Um, words like demonstrate, it's a yes or a no, right? Did you do it or did you not? So there's not a lot of space in there to look at the quality of your students' work or engagement. Um, uh, examine, it's pretty straightforward. It's a lower level verb. You can look at things and there's no demonstration or no, no representation of skill associated with it, but it's did you read it, essentially, right? So um, just looking at if those are the, the, the words, the phrases, the things that you really want your students to come away from the course with um, is a good way to look at those elements. So goals and outcomes, are they just six one way, half dozen the other? Definitely not, in my opinion. Goals um, are tasks to complete, they're information to know and they're experiences to have. These goals are really more synonymous with your assignments in your course. Outcomes are, what can I do now? How have I changed? How will my career be impacted? You know, how am I different? So outcomes look at uh, the differences seen in students as a result of the work that they've done, the goals that they've had. Um, so a good example of this is a pretty ubiquitous one, losing weight. My goal is to lose 10 pounds, right? So what's the outcome of losing 10 pounds? The outcome of losing 10 pounds is maybe I can go on a longer hike without getting out of breath or pick up my kid without, and play with him in the backyard without um, needing to go in and take a rest or um, my heart rate improves, you know, whatever it may be. But the outcome is really what we're moving toward, right? It's not, I'm not losing weight to lose weight. I'm losing weight so that I can move toward that outcome. It's the same thing with our students. We want them to have experiences so we can see how they're different. I'm a proponent of designing courses that are outcomes focused um, because I think they're a better indication of where our students are at, where they're going, and how they're prepared for their work. So um, just a couple of quick tips for writing outcomes. First, be brief. Um, longer outcomes are not better. Uh, outcomes with more information in them are not necessarily better. They're much harder to measure with single learning activities and assignments. Use strong verbs <clears throat> and use, use one verb. Don't use two verbs at the front of your, your outcome because, again, we're issues with measurability. Uh, don't accept your first draft. It's never good enough. You're always going to want to iterate on it until it's exactly how you want it to be. And then finally, articulate the change that you expect to see. 
So focus on transformation, not on, not on what, um, but really on, on, on uh, how or on where they're going. Any questions, things I can answer? You know, I'm throwing a lot of info out there quickly, so sorry if we're, we're moving at a quick pace here. I'm also happy to walk through the map again or field any questions. Typically when I do this, I like to have a workshop time, but we had 30 minute sessions here. So we're just, I'm just throwing the information at you and seeing what the experience is. And I can tell you all that um, if this has piqued your interest and you're like, I wanna do this and I wanna collaborate with an instructional designer to do this, um, get in touch with CU Online because we have um, two instructional designers currently. We are working with faculty to go through the collaborative mapping, mapping model, being a partner with you, an extra set of eyes on your course to sort of help you think about this. We also, if you're redesigning an online course, we have a grant that you can get for going through the process. We also have um, our instructional design summer camp coming up at the beginning of June that we're offering a stipend um, for faculty to come and part of that is the mapping process as well as a lot of other instructional design related uh, information in that our goal is that you're going to come out of there an instructional designer <laughs> that's the, that's the goal so please get in touch with CU online in your autograph book our websites on there um, we would love to map with you yeah absolutely you know this model um, some people look at it and they think man it's going to take so much more time to sit down with somebody in design um, with my faculty it's it's saved us a lot of time in design work a lot of time it's become a very scalable approach because as we get used to the mapping approach, um, they start to take on elements of that themselves. And my, and my involvement kind of goes more like this. And I act in more of a consultative role rather than a guiding role. Um, it's really gratifying to see that work and see our faculty becoming really passionate about the designs that they're using for their courses. Um, and it's also helpful because, you know, hopefully you have time to invest in other things rather than uh, spending more time than necessary in your design work. So what questions can I answer? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. <coughs> sure. For an eight week course, I like to make sure there's one learning activity a week, potentially more, depending on the level of sophistication. Discussions, if they're pretty um, uh, small in scale, can be, uh, you can have one every week on top of something else. Students tend to resist that if they get into a, a consistent rhythm that they feel like is artificial. So discussions have the, have the tendency to become uh, rote over time. And so changing it up with uh, different technologies or uh, approaches can be a really positive way to help make those stay engaging. Um, so one example for that is I like to uh, encourage my faculty and in, in courses I've taught in the past as well to instead of doing that first week, introduce yourself in a paragraph and tell me about your interest for your career, um, have them create a three song playlist using Spotify that represents something they care about in your course. And then use that as a way to have an entire soundtrack for your course where your students get to know each other and you get to know your students through the music that they enjoy. Um, those sorts of things are good connecting points. They, they in, in improve the social presence that you have in, in your course. They connect students to each other and to you, which is a great way to improve their learning. Um, and it helps disrupt in a positive way that really, uh, uh, that really consistent experience of answering a discussion question and replying to a few people. Um, beyond that, I would, I would probably say um, in an accelerated model, like an eight-week course instead of 15, uh, the tendency is I have half the time to do the same amount of work. So I have to cram it full, do everything that I normally would in a 15-week course. The challenge, of course, is you know, double the information in half the amount of time, you're going to reduce the amount of things that your students are retaining and transferring to their experience. So um, what I encourage people to do is design with your gut. You know, look at it, look at the experiences and think, you know, is this something that my students are really going to latch on to in the amount of time that they have here? And if the answer is yes, then 
have more than one assignment, that's fine. If the answer is they need to spend a little bit more time digging into this to really get it, um, then leave a little bit more space. Um, space is an important part of design. Every inch of your course shouldn't be crammed full with stuff because then your students don't have any space to really explore it and evaluate it and, and, and work through it. So um, no, that's not a very specific answer. I hope that's useful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, things like uh, like the playlist are, are kind of a good example. You can use um, if you if you choose to create a course map, head to you know see you online and connect with the designer. Um, Bubble.us is a great tool to introduce to your students as well. Concept mapping in a, in a less um, in a less formal structure here can be a really good way to help your students connect with the material on their own level mm -hmm. rather than yours and see where they're moving. So. There are lots of little tools like that online that are useful. We've had people do um, collages, pick five you know, images that represent what your understanding of the work this week. Anything that you can do to integrate some, some element of uh, creativity or artistry to your, to your course and to your students' work um, is a good way to, to bolster those experiences. And you can make an appointment to come in for a consultation with us to talk about, maybe you have a couple assignments that you want to make, you want to change, and you just want to sit down and talk and talk through ideas make an appointment, come in, we'll even come to you and spend an hour and sit down and talk through ideas of ways to do that. And we're, exactly, yeah, and I'll tell you, Sarah, who's our other designer, and I, that's our favorite thing to do, is to come sit <laughs> down and talk with you and just talk about ideas of ways to make um, your excellent content uh, more student friendly. Yeah, I think we're, are we out of time? We're at 11, okay. Thank you all for coming. I hope this has been helpful. Please come talk to me uh, anytime today if you'd like to learn more. I'd love to love to chat with you. So thank you. <laughs>